wall of pain. How ethnography can help to identify the hidden epidemic of the global south. Julie Livingston, Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey. When the wall came down, I was in my hometown, Boston, visiting my grandmother in the hospital. Good morning, um, and many thanks to the organizers, and especially the Wissenschaftskolleg, for providing me the opportunity to speak with you. It's wonderful to participate in marking what I think is a very important day here in Berlin. Unlike my uh, fellow speakers today, I don't have any images or sounds or multimedia to offer you. Only some words about pain, even though some people have said that pain is an experience that defies language. Earlier this year, I was sitting in, in an um, examination room in an oncology clinic in a large public hospital in southern Africa. The room was thick with anxiety. An older man, about 75 years old with prostate cancer, was sitting awkwardly on a white plastic chair in the clinic room. His jaw was clenched shut, and though it was relatively cool, he was sweating terribly as his fingers gripped the arms of the chair. His wife sat next to him, and maybe this uh, echoes <laughs> what Tanya has said. She kept her arm across his back, her hand reminding him that she was there. His two sons and a daughter-in-law stood opposite in this small room, leaning against the exam table as the doctor spoke to them. Two years previously, this man, the patient, had undergone an orchiectomy, the surgical removal of the testes, to stem the progression of his cancer. If he'd been in a wealthier context, he could have taken an expensive hormone therapy instead. The surgery, while intense, had helped him, but it couldn't hold off the cancer forever, and so now he was entering the final stage. But it would be several months before he died, and already the metastases were pushing pain through the marrow of his bones. This pain was exquisite, and he remained quiet during the conversation, totally absorbed in the struggle to maintain his composure. Palliative radiation could have helped him, but the linear accelerator in this hospital, one of only two sites for radiation in the country I was in, was broken, as it had been for some time, and it looked like it might be many months before it could be fixed. There was paracetamol, a mild analgesic, stocked in the hospital pharmacy, but even though the patient was taking it, it was clearly inadequate to provide him relief. Morphine could have helped, but it wasn't available, not stocked in this hospital pharmacy. Morphine is not a very expensive drug. The patent has long expired, if there ever was one, so his family could have purchased it for him. But it was out of stock in all the private pharmacies in this city of one and a half million people. Most pharmacists were af uh, afraid of running afoul of a thicket of laws surrounding illicit distribution and possession of opiates, which carried very, very steep penalties and therefore opened them to harassment and extortion by the police. And so they simply didn't uh, stock opiates at all. There were rumors that a hospital in a neighboring city, some several hundred kilometers away, did have morphine. And so the clinical conversation turned into a strategizing session. How to put funds together to send a family member to collect the morphine? Who among them could spare three days to make the round trip by public bus? Where would this person spend the night in this other city? Which clinician could they contact at this other hospital to confirm the supply of the drug and to ensure that it would be released to the relative even though they wouldn't have a patient present with them? This scene I've just described of managing pain without medicines is an all too common one in hospitals and private homes across the global south. Sometimes it's an elderly father with prostate cancer. Sometimes it's a young child who suffered an accident. It might be a sister with AIDS. Patients squirm or clench or writhe or moan in tremendous and often constant pain. They retreat from social interaction. Most can't work. And many patients in southern Africa have told me that before they could access relief, they had fantasized about suicide. It seemed like the only thing that promised to release them from their torture. In India, patients have told researchers from Human Rights Watch the same. One AIDS hospice in Vietnam had no HIV or TB medications and no opioids when they opened in 2001. And so they built a screaming room 
whereas palliative care specialist Eric Krakauer explains staff could tend to those patients in extreme distress while also maintaining the well-being of their fellow hospice residents. In the years before gaining access to effective medications, this screaming room was a necessary functional aspect of this hospice. Relatives spend wakeless nights massaging their patients, witnessing their agony, and yet they're essentially helpless to assist their loved ones, whose care weighs upon them as a grave moral burden. For the lucky few in this situation, they do have relatives who are able to access and determine where opiate analgesics are available, often deploying tremendous personal resources in order to do so. <clears throat> Yet sometimes they only succeed in providing um, for their patient these opiate analgesics for a few days at a time. This pain, as you can well imagine, is awful for the patient. But ethnographic research also reveals that the importance of pain supersedes its effects for the individual subject. And again, this uh, echoes what Tanya has said. Pain, as it turns out, has tremendous social effects. Think of our man with prostate cancer. His wife can't leave him to attend to her fields during the day. His son has to lose days of work, hoping to procure that morphine. And the family who's already gone around collecting money for a unit of blood only a week previously now has to raise funds for this son's bus fare and for the morphine itself. Think of the screaming room and the many contexts where clinical staff must choose to ignore the agony that surrounds them, given that they have no relief to offer. What effect does this have on staff over time and their ability to sustain commitment to their patients? In the Global South, um, think of all the resources and attention that are spent trying to get patients to come to biomedical sites for their health care instead of going to quote unquote traditional healers. And yet the irony that these very programs ignore this fundamental bodily experience of agony as the most primary of patient motivations. When Sebastian Turner helped uh, to put together the far more exciting title for my talk than I myself probably could have come up with, uh, it did promise that ethnography would be integral to breaking down walls. So what is ethnography, and where does its promise lie in contributing in some small way to improving global health? Well, unlike many of my colleagues here, this isn't rocket science that I have to offer. If someone has a tumor in their nasopharynx and it's pushing their eye out of the socket, you don't need me to tell you that it is terribly painful. You don't need to tell me to tell you that the ibuprofen at that man's local clinic is inadequate to the task. So it isn't cutting-edge science or technology that I have to offer. And yet I've just described real people that I meet every day in the context of my work. They have problems that will not necessarily be solved by the development of new technologies, so much as they would be improved by the circulation and increased use of long-standing and highly effective tools. The problem of pain lies at the nexus of a tremendous amount of activity and import, reminding us that the experience of illness is much broader than the demographic outcome of disease. The patient might die, they might be cured, and this, of course, matters tremendously. But so too does the extreme bodily distress they endure during the months and weeks of serious illness. And so what ethnography, as a scientific method of careful, long-term, systematic participant observation, conjoined to a humanistic mode of writing, offers, is to help us see that all this pain is a problem, one with tremendous moral, economic, and social consequences. Ethnography helps to place pain in the center of attention and to politicize it as a wall in need of breaking. Of course, ethnography doesn't do this alone. There are patients, there are activists, there are palliative care specialists who are working hard to remediate this situation. But ethnography is a good tool for identifying these kinds of hidden problems and setting them out in all their complexity. Of course, ethnography describes a situation that I could also express statistically, if you like. I could say that in 2008, and this is according to um, data that's aggregated by the International Narcotics Board, um, that in Germany, consumption of therapeutic morphine equivalents, so morphine and its equivalent drugs, things like fentanyl, uh, was around 413 milligrams per capita. That's much less, about two-thirds the rate in my own country, the United States, which was 648 milligrams per capita. 
but Germans nonetheless consumed nearly 10 times the amount of your neighbors next door in Poland at 45 milligrams per capita, or patients in Iran at 51, and about 2,000 times the amount as in India at 0.2 milligrams. So clearly there are some walls that need to be broken unless you really believe that life in Germany is actually a thousand times more painful than it is in Botswana, where I often do my work. And yet it's taken a great deal of hard work for many years by people in the palliative care movement to try to bring pain to the attention of national and international policymakers, funders, and even clinical staff in many areas of the world. If I had started my talk by asking you all to name what you think the pressing problems in global health are right now, you probably would have mentioned HIV, maybe tuberculosis, maybe malaria, maybe maternal mortality, and you would be right. But pain itself probably wouldn't have occurred to you, even though it is the dimension of the illness experience that's the easiest for you to envision, given that pain is something which unites us as human beings. And until the past decade or so, the kind of statistics that I just gave you were aggregated by the Narcotics Board, but not discussed very much in public health outside of the very small world of global cancer care and palliative care. For many years, other issues seemed more pressing in the zero-sum world of global health, where various diseases and tools compete for attention and resources. And laws and policies governing the distribution of opiates we're far more concerned with halting drug abuse and trafficking, which admittedly are very important problems, than with the other use of opiates, their intended use, pain relief. Fortunately, due to the hard work of many activists, there is a small global palliative care movement underway, and in a few very select places, this situation has just begun to change. But how could institutions charged with promoting health and providing uh, care have ignored or marginalized such a fundamental experience as pain for so long? Well, from a policy and planning perspective, it starts to make sense, because most of these health systems were evaluated through a, a set of metrics that capture demographic outcomes, but render the experience of disease invisible. And so in that kind of context, pain management becomes something of a frill that distracts from the core concerns of health care. Then if pain relief isn't available, and if doctors and nurses and pharmacists aren't trained to prioritize it, patients don't expect to receive it. They don't ask for it, relatives don't demand it, and so pain remains depoliticized in health care, even as patients writhe in agony. Pain relief is not a substitute for effective medical care. It's an integral part of it. Nothing palliates like cure. So I'm not suggesting that we simply pour, pour uh, morphine into health systems that also need um, efficacious drugs like ARVs or antibiotics. But nonetheless, as palliation is bundled and built into health systems, it does a number of things that strengthen those health systems in critical ways. Pain relief humanizes the medical process and its institutions by paying attention to people and not just disease. Palliation assists caregivers in the psychic load of their work, and this is very critical uh, given that health care for the sick depends on the commitments of staff that often prove very difficult to sustain over time, particularly in resource-poor contexts. And of course, the experience of relatives in caring for one patient shapes their willingness and indeed their emotional ability to care for the next. And most of all, pain relief releases human beings from tortuous circumstances. These are phenomena that are hidden in the statistics, but revealed by ethnography, a hidden epidemic, one might call it, and a troubling wall that can be broken by tools already at our disposal. Thank you. <laughs>